Hey everyone, DCB here again. You know, I kinda had fun doing that last video of my top 10 favorite serial mascots. So I decided to try another top 10 list. Here's some not so surprising information about me. I like vintage toys. I admire them, I collect them, and for the past 30 some years, I've made a business selling them. The toys I mostly played with as a child and the toys I gravitate towards today have one thing in common, they're very unisex, meaning they're not overtly feminine nor masculine. I started my toy playing days as a toddler with Fisher-Price Little People, and then as I got a little older, it became Lego and Playmobil, and then finally Star Wars. So let's get back to talking about Fisher-Price Little People. They, in their classic peg body shape, were introduced in the 1960s and lasted into the 1980s, peaking in popularity in the 70s. Most every Gen Xer instantly recognizes them and either had some or knew someone who did. If you've seen a few of my other videos, you know that I'm a huge enthusiast of them as well. I have made a few art pieces in their likeness and have a pretty decent collection of them. When a product line becomes a huge success, there will no doubt be competition to try to get in on that market. In the 70s, several toy companies came out with their own versions of non-articulated figurines and play sets. Some of them were mildly successful, and you may remember them, but other ones, maybe not so much. I compiled a list of the 10 that I think managed to have some impact on the market. I love Mattel toys. I've collected many different Mattel toys. But one common factor these toys I liked all had was that they were made between the years 1965 and 1970. This, for me, was the golden age of Mattel. But something happened to them as they entered into the 1970s. I don't know if they fired all their design staff or what, but the toys they started producing just didn't have that same Mattel quality to it. That's painfully evident with their submission to the toddler playset world. They were called Putt Putt and People, and they debuted in 1973. The sets consisted of wooden vehicles and hard plastic figures with printed on details. The scale was all over the place and the figures could only go in some of the vehicles. It was a mess. Admittedly, I don't recall these at all from my youth. I do come across the vehicles now and then, but I had no idea until researching this video that they even came with figures. I only discovered it because I happened to have one of the figures on my shelf and I decided to Google it. I have to acknowledge that the figures are pretty dang cute, though. Play School Bug World was introduced in 1978. This is another set that I don't recall at all from my youth, but I do find pieces of it from time to time, so I'm adding it to the list. When I first found a loose figure, I initially thought it was a Sesame Street Tweedlebug. It's not, but I'm sure they were the inspiration. They only made this one set, an adorable little house that's like a cross-section of Earth, complete with a garden hose pipe elevator, furniture, and vehicles made from vegetables. The figures were a squishy vinyl. Most everyone loves Charlie Brown and the Peanuts Gang. They're a timeless classic. In the 1970s, Child Guidance got the license to make play sets. They came out with a camp set, a beach set, a little piano, and the coolest set of them all, this Evil Knievel-inspired Snoopy Scooter Shooter. The figures were a soft vinyl, but they kind of had a wonky likeness of the characters. Evenflow is a company most known for making car seats and baby bottles, but in the 70s, they had these bath toy figures called Water Derby and Rafties. I actually collect these myself. They were individually sold on cards. The Water Derbies featured a figure on a floating sea creature, whereas the Rafties had two figures and some floating piece like an iceberg or an island. The figures were squishy vinyl. What could be better than a miniature figure of Colonel Sanders? How about an entire Kentucky Fried Chicken playset to go with it? This set by Child Guidance 
featured a restaurant that swung open, and inside the colonel stood behind the counter to hand the figures their food on a tray, which they would hold by a slit sculpted into their bodies. And like the box says, you'll have a barrel of fun. Not a bucket, but a barrel. Gilligan's Island debuted in 1964 and ran for three seasons. It had numerous made-for-TV movies and a cartoon series as well. Most everyone knows the show because it continues to live on in syndication to this day. But despite its immense popularity, there was very little merchandise made, not even a lunchbox. Hell, Bobby Sherman got a lunchbox. There must have been some sort of difficult licensing issue. I blame Ginger. Anyway, Play School somehow managed to snag a license and made this wonderful floating island toy in 1977. The characters were based off the filmation cartoon version of Gilligan, the Skipper, and Marianne. That's all that came with the set, but who more do you really need? Though a Jim Backus figure would be pretty swell to have. Fun fact! I actually sold a loose Gilligan figure to Bob Denver many years ago on eBay. Another entry from Play School. This is the Richard Scary Puzzle Town playsets. They were really unique in that they contained interlocking plastic grid plates with cardboard building panels that would click into slots. This way you could build up your village and add more sets, and each set came with just a few accessories, a vehicle of sorts, and a figure or two. The figures were a perfect likeness of the Busy Town characters and were made from a hard vinyl with a plastic disc base. Kenner got into the toddler playset game with their line called the Tree Tots. Initially called this because the first set introduced was a family that lived in a tree. The top of the tree house had a button on it that, when pushed, would rise up revealing their home inside. The tree also featured a handle so you could store all the pieces and carry it with you. Other sets were also introduced, but none of them reached the popularity of the original treehouse. Here's another fun fact. Kenner is pretty known for reusing and repurposing their old toys, and in 1985, the tree set was remodeled to become the Ewoks playset. Yet another offering from Play School. These are probably the closest to Fisher-Price Little People, but instead of round, they were square. I can't find any reference to them actually having a name other than play friends, but I always just referred to them as blockheads. In addition to this fire rescue center, they did a series called Familiar Places that were, you know, familiar places. They had a McDonald's, a Holiday Inn, and this very rare Texaco station. The figures were a hard plastic with printed on features. Here's a recap of what we have so far. And the number one spot for non Fisher Price toddler playset figures goes to the Weebles. And just for the record, that is their name Weebles. Not Weeble Wobbles, as I often hear people calling them. Just Weebles. These figures had their characters printed on a thin plastic film that was inserted inside a clear egg shape and a weight was placed in their bottom so that they always stood upright. There were several sets made, all of which are pretty hard to find. I estimated once that I come across probably 500 Fisher-Price Little People for every one Weeble. The one set that seems to show up the most is the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, which is kind of lame. But the most desirable set, hands down, is the Haunted House. It was a Victorian house reminiscent of the Adams Family home. Inside was a secret bookshelf panel that turned to reveal a fun mirror. The set came with two scared children, a witch, and a glow-in-the-dark ghost. You could also buy an additional ghost van vehicle, for the ghost to drive around town in. So those are my picks for the top 10 best non-Fisher-Price toddler play sets. What do you think? Did I miss any? What was your favorite? Let me know in the comments section and thanks for watching.
you're weird. 